So thank you, Gedimiraz, for the uh, invitation. You're a great host as always, uh, and uh, it's it's been a great pleasure to be here again with these. So thank you for putting together this great conference, also with the rest of the. Uh, theme. So before starting, I would like to thank, uh, acknowledge my collaborators. So the works I'm going to present today involve several active collaborations, particularly in view of this talk. It's worth mentioning uh, Nigel, Robert, Adrian, and Andre who was here. Uh, but I've also had the great chance of taking some of these ideas and then test them in the experiments. And Christoph is uh, among among us uh, today. So um, I. I'm generally interested in topology um, and the geometric concepts, how they emerge in the quantum simulation uh, systems. And uh, particularly when we have these topological ideas in the equilibrium, and if we just like include time dependency, uh, this allows us to discover new kind of phenomena, new invariants, and new connections between topological invariants. So this can be in the form of adiabatic pumps or quenches or uh, periodic driving. So today uh, I want to talk about new kind of topologies that have been emerging in multi-level systems. For that, after giving a quick overview of Floquet uh, and anomalous topology that appear, uh, arises in Floquet systems, I want to talk about this non-abelian Euler class and uh, give a broader geometric uh, perspective that reaches beyond the Euler class. So this, um, so we heard about Floquet several times, and then this, this crowd doesn't need an introduction to it. Uh, but just uh, as a quick recap, what happens is that when we have a two-dimensional system, and then if we sun send some laser light or periodically shake the system, uh, we lose the uh, static description because this laser is constantly pumping energy. We cannot talk about uh, static energy. Uh, but what we can talk about is the quasi-energies, which are defined as the phase eigenvalues of the time evolution operator at the end of one period. And because these are phase eigenvalues, so now these can be only defined modulo 2 pi. So if you have a two-level system, we end up having infinitely many copies, replicas of them. And since I'm interested in topology, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, today. So, and uh, when we have this description, we lose the the churn number description on any other like tenfold way descriptions that we know in the equilibrium system. Because uh, practically, what's happening is that uh, when we have like things can also happen between the replicas of this banana. So this was the anomalous Floquet topology. It's been also observed in the observed in the experiment by using the different methods. But now we can have edge states in the replicas of the bands in the pi gap, but also in the zero gap. So here, this is labeled instead of the two-dimensional invariant of Chern number. Now this is labeled in terms of the winding number, a three-dimensional invariant, and we have these one-one phase. So in a also recent study, we consider these honeycomb lattice under several different drives. For example, you can have anomalous phase or the Haldane-like phases with edge states only in one of the one of the gaps. But we also focused on um, previously overlooked phase, which have uh, which has edge states in both gaps, but with different different winding numbers, different chiralities. So, and then this is some phase that's truly out of equilibrium that you have a bit more like the spin hall effect. You have different channels going on uh, on, on different phases. So. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but I want to quickly flash some recent results because it resonates nicely with the theme of this talk of the synthetic quantum matter. Uh, because uh, one uh, recent ability that's being developed in these systems are the single site accessibility, right? We also heard about this uh, this this morning in Richard's talk. So, uh, with the edge states that you can just like create sharp edges, uh, we can now ask about ask ourselves that okay, so I have this Floquet system, I have edge states in different gaps, and now you can think about that I have edge states in different quasi energy gaps, but is that system, the transport in that system, those is, that, is it any different than a Haldane phase that I can uh, reach in the static setting, for example, with respect to each other, how do I probe? So this is this was something that we, we uh, considered by taking some cylinder or finite system and initializing some wave package. And one interesting result is that when I have this 1-1 one -one phase, so I have at channels in both gaps, and then I consider some cylinder, I initialize some wave packet, and then I look at the transport. So this is the at t equals zero, wave packet is initialized. These are the density, so it goes nicely, uh, follows the edge motion around the edge of the cylinder. And then if you compare this thing with the Haldane phases, so 
I again have some, some dispersion, but if you actually look at the, the color code, which you cannot see, but, but this is, I have much more probability at the edge. And this was something surprising uh, for us. And we systematically studied this thing by considering cuts along the, along the phase diagram. So we initialize some wave packet and we look at how much of the wave packet goes and populates the edge states. So we count this number while we are just like taking cuts. And then when you have two edge channels, when you're in the anomalous phase, it's much easier to prepare the wave packet at the edge state, so you see much more robust transport, more, more of the probability goes there. And then this is something generic also in this minus one, one phase. Now they go in both way, they don't hybridize, and churn number is given by the number of differences. And these um, signatures have been also observed in the, in the Munich experiment that's, uh, that's been reported very recently. So. This is the anomalous flow K topology. So it's been interesting. It's been attracting a lot of attention. But that, and also with the, all the topological classifications that we have known so far, they have been single gap topologies. What it means is that I have some Fermi energy or some like gap that I'm interested in. And then the topological protection in the system correlates with the changes happening at that gap. OK, so this is the tenfold way K-theory K classification. Recently, there's, uh, these uh, multi-gap topologies have been uh, arising in the last two or three, three years. And then what's happening is that you need, under C2T or PT symmetry, you need minimum three bands. Not single gap, two bands, minimum three bands. And then the topological pro uh, protection correlates uh, arises because of the intertwining of the gaps, both of both of the gaps. So the the so band nodes, dual cones in the systems have non-abelian charges, and then I can take two band nodes in different gaps. Normally, in the first gap, for example, they can annihilate each other, and then if I just like take another node in the other gap and then move them around in the mo momentum space, I can braid, I can change their charges. So at the end, they have the same charges in this gap, and then they cannot annihilate. So this invariant, earlier uh, earlier invariant, is expressed as an abelian Berry curvature for the eigenstates that involves those bands. And then it measures exactly this. It measures obstruction against annihilation, whether your drag cone can cancel or, or not. So uh, concrete experimental signatures of this non-abelian uh, phases are. So it's an active, uh, active uh, um, area of research at the moment. And um, we also had one, one proposal when you have uh, involving quench dynamics. Again, if you just like, include time, time dependency, oh, interesting things happen. So if you have this non-abelian twisting in your Hamiltonian, and then if you suddenly change your system to evolve under this Hamiltonian, you can see linking numbers, similar to what Christoph measured in Hamburg. But now they, there are monopole, antimonopole pairs giving rise to this thing, and then this proposal has been also implemented in trapped ions. So this tells you that whether you have this non-abelian twisting in your Hamiltonian, but now I want to focus on directly this braiding of the band nodes. So for that, a nice picture of understanding how this braiding works is through the Dirac strings. So now, um, so I want to, so this looks like, um, some some runes or just like some weird scripts, but let me just like tell you. So I, I just like imagine that I start from uh, atomic limits. I have three bands, completely trivial, nothing is happening. I'm gonna enable. I'm gonna uh, induce some band uh, inversions in the first band between eigenstates one and two, and I will represent them as triangles. Empty field means that they have opposite charges when I created them out of vacuum, okay? The uh, field and empty circles are for band nodes that I'm, uh, I have in the second gap, okay? So I start from the completely trivial band. I induce two band nodes in band one. So I look at the brilliant zone from the top. They are, uh, I just like created opposite charges and then they are connected by a Dirac string. So this Dirac string has to be, uh, always has to be there because when I have a Dirac cone, if I do an adiabatic transport around the wave function, I cannot define the phase consistently. At some point, it must flip its charge. And this Dirac string is that one. This is present also in graphene. That's the, because Dirac cone has a pi charge. So now I create one more pair of band nodes in gap two. Okay, so now if I have an Euler class description, if I take this band node with positive charge in gap two, and then if I move it in the brilliant zone and then across the Dirac string in the other gap, it flips its charge. So uh, 
this this is an abelian braiding a way of illustrating it so and then i take this uh, band node in gap one now empty triangle and then if i cross the direct string of the in the other gap it flips its charge again and then what i mean with this crossing the band node is that i literally i have some hamiltonian in the momentum space i'm modifying the hamiltonian you can imagine that you have some uh, system you're just like s applying some strain this has been predicted, this kind of rating in phonon bands, where temperature works, for example, you are modifying, you're just like modifying your Hamiltonian to induce some Dirac cones, band nodes, and then modifying your Hamiltonian a little bit more to m make the band nodes move. So now, I, these nodes in the gap two, for example, now, now they have same charges. If I clash them head on, they cannot annihilate each other. So now I play this game one more time. I create one more pair in gap, gap one. I take this uh, um, empty circle, cross the direct string in the other gap. It flips its charge. I take this one, cross, now it, has, is, it has, again has positive charge. So now these band nodes in gap two, they have opposite charges. So if I now clash them head on, I, they will annihilate each other in the same way that I created them. And then I arrive at this phase. So I have uh, three bands. I have four band nodes in gap one, and they all have same charges, and nothing. Third gap band is completely gapped. So now it looks like I, I did some trick, right? I, I shouldn't be able to create topological charges out of nowhere. If I have a topological charge with positive, I must also have its negative counterparts. But now here I'm showing you that there are four positively charged topological singularities. But of course, I didn't uh, cheat it. I didn't uh, violate any rule, uh, law because this is a state I can only come through an abelian braiding. So this is why I mean that this is a multi-gap phase. It involves an abelian braiding. Okay, so it's also fragile in the sense that this band is completely trivial that I can undo the braiding and uh, so. So these things are. I'm allowed to do this because when I have a three-band system, uh, when I if I have C two T or T T. PT symmetry. So what does C2 do? It takes K to minus K. Time reversal symmetry takes this back to K, but also complex conjugate. So if Hamiltonian has C2T symmetry, it must commute with its complex conjugate, which means that it is real. So for its eigenstates, so now this is a three-band Hamiltonian, three by three Hamiltonian, its eigenstates are three by one vector, and I can find them also real. If I treat them, and I can treat them as real vectors, because they are not naturally orthonormal, so they form a dry band. And if I have band singularities on this dry band for this SO3, I need to fix a frame for this dry band, right? I can write the third eigenstate as the cross product or the minus product, so then I have the point group D2, and the pi1 charges in this, in this dry band takes values from the quaternion charges. And quaternion, quaternions are a non-abelian algebra. So this is why I am allowed to do this non-abelian braiding. And then I'm, I will show you some results for this non-abelian uh, Euler phases. So this is what we are doing in the background. But we can also, I will focus on this direct string picture because in view of time, this is uh, much uh, nicer to um, illustrate things. So now uh, I showed you this non-abelian braiding. Uh, when, we have, when I have three bands, I can braid the band nodes in adjacent gaps. So now this brings an important question, because if I have a Floquet system, when I have three bands, I'm going to have infinitely many replicas of them. And then I have one additional gap in between the replicas, the pi gap. I can have band nodes in that gap. That's what's, uh, what has been measured in, in, in Munich, for example. And I can also braid the band nodes. So this was, uh, by doing this braiding, so we just like showed that Floquet is a nice way of modifying this Hamiltonian. It allows us to reach non abelian artificial erbium phases that arises due to Floquet uh, and allows us to reach new edge states or new topological phases. So to make things concrete, so now uh, let me assume a Kagome lattice. Kagome lattice is three band, uh, has, uh, uh, has three band system. We like Kagome lattice because in the absence of any sublattice offsets in static system, it already has a flat band. Flat bands are interesting. And Kagome lattice has already C2T symmetry, which means that it already has an Euler description. And when, it, when you look at this familiar Kagome band structure, this gamma node here, it already has an Euler charge one. 
it means that it, it's formed out of two band nodes that have same Euler charges. And the KK prime nodes in the Brillian zone are there, uh, they have opposite charges, they are connected by a Dirac string. So if you calculate this non-abelian Euler curvature uh, here for this shaded zone, it has zero charge, which means that KK prime can annihilate each other. So now I take this Kagome and I want to induce some Floquet drive on it to start playing with the Hamiltonian parameters. So if you want to reach some non-trivial non churn phases that we, we have been interested in recently, what you want to do is that you want to break time reversal symmetry. Here you don't want to break that because I want to preserve the C2T symmetry. C2 is uh, pretty rudimentary. So what I do is that I can send a linearly polarized right or linearly shake the system that I want to keep the C2T symmetry. And uh, this under minimal coupling, that this goes and couples to the momentum, and without any loss of generality, I will only consider a drive along the x direction. So now I can tune the frequency of the drive, amplitude of the drive, and I can also induce sublattice offsets. Uh, two of them, because third one, I'm just going to scale it to fix the gauge to center the bands around zero. Okay, so by tuning these four parameters in the system, so now what kind of non-abelian braidings or like new phases we can we can we can reach? So now let's look at that. So one example is this anomalous Dirac string phase that arises only in this this system. So what's happening is that in this Kagome system, so this is a static. Dirac string configuration in the Brillian zone. The moment you start shaking the system, you break C6 symmetry. And gamma node is protected by the double node is protected by the C6 symmetry. So the moment you start shaking, this gamma node has to separate into, into two. They still have same charges. They have Euler charge one. They are connected by a Dirac string. And when I just like uh, start shaking, so now I want to decrease the one of the sublattice offsets, okay, under under this driving. When I uh, decrease the sublattice offset, these gamma nodes separate. They cross one Dirac string. This one, its charge flips, and then if I am at sufficiently low, you know, driving frequencies, these Floquet bands. This is the one Floquet brillion zone. It can also I can also induce new nodes at the at the zone edge. So now these are the empty field uh, squares, green ones. So I created two band nodes between the replicas. They cross two Dirac strings, so they still have opposite charges. I keep decreasing, tuning the parameters. KK prime uh, annihilates each other with their replicas. They leave the Dirac string behind. Gamma nodes just like goes across the Dirac uh, brilliant zone and then annihilates with their pairs across the brilliant zone, leaves their drag string behind. And the, the third band nodes, they go to the third possible endpoint possible in the brilliant zone and then leave their drag string behind. This looks like, I have this face, three bands completely ba gapped, it looks boring. But it's nothing but boring because if I look at the brilliant zone, I have the maximum possible drag string configuration in the brilliant zone along all directions. and because this Dirac string is not possible to obtain in the in the static limit, if I take this system and I put it in a finite strip ribbon geometry, it has to project along the edge because there is a Dirac string means that your Zach phase is picking up a pi phase, and then I have this anomalous edge state present at the gap. And then if you look at that state, it's completely localized at the at the edge of the system. So this is a phase that you can come arrive at only through non-abelian uh, braiding, only in a Floquet system out of equilibrium setting. So as an uh, another example, uh, by tuning now two of the sublattice offsets, for example, this time gamma nodes behave quicker they annihilate each other, and then these anomalous green nodes, now they're also faster than the KK prime node, they annihilate right in the middle of the KK prime nodes. They wanted to annihilate each other, but now there's this Dirac string, and these nodes, to annihilate each other, they have to cross a Dirac string, which means that their charge is going to get flipped, it means that they cannot annihilate each other, and then they have, if you calculate it, you will see that they have the Euler charge one, which means that I started from here with some Euler charge, I did braiding, and then transferred the Euler charge to these bands, 
where because of the Dirac string in the in the anomalous gap, again some phase that you can only arrive at this thing, and in similar way, when you have floquet, you know that you can invert the band structure where gamma notes now arranges itself as the as the as like KK prime notes, and this is a process again you can you have to braid the band notes to it. To do to do this thing, so these are just some some a few examples that uh, that we can just like reach in in this system, but in my uh, remaining time, I don't know how how many minutes. <laughs> Perfect, then I will be very quick. So now I want to take a step back. So multi-level system. So this is interesting topology. I'm, uh, I've been saying the non-abelian braiding and stuff. So, but even without non-abelian braiding, when I have a multi-level system, things can be quite complicated, right? When I, I mean, we like two-level systems. They're minimal models. I have the nice description of a blob sphere that like we like illustrating qubits, dynamics on it. They are pretty useful. So. When I go to a multi-level system, I can equally adapt a geometric view, like the Bloch sphere. Any Hamiltonian can be fully expressed in terms of the Gelman matrices or generalized Gelman matrices. Wave functions, if I sandwich the Gelman matrices, they are expressed as a coherence vector, as, as I call them, on a generalized Bloch sphere density matrices. And this is a description that is valid for pure states or mixed states. If you're on the surface of your generalized Bloch sphere, you are pure. If you're in the uh, inside of it, you are mixed. So, but we are not that used to seeing these descriptions because when I consider three-level system. I have eight Gelman matrices, so I want you to now try to imagine a seven vector, uh, eight vector on a seven sphere in eight dimensions. That is the below hyperfair sphere. So it's hardly intuitive, right? So in my remaining time, I want to give you an intuitive picture. So when I have a qubit, I can express what I need is that I need to distribute the probability between the two bases, right? With polar angle and then because this is a quantum phase I also need to put a phase difference between them and then if I calculate the coherence vector this points to some direction on the Bloch sphere so now when I have a Q thread I the Q thread requires three co uh, complex numbers so six real numbers but if uh, if this is normalized so one constraint overall phase doesn't matter so I can express any Q thread in CP2, complex projective plane, with four independent parameters. Now I want to choose these four independent parameters as Euler angles. What I want to do is that I want to introduce some theta angle to distribute the probability between this element of the wave function and this element, sine cosine. And then within these two, I induced another var theta, another polar angle, to distribute the probability, so it's completely normalized. Now I put a phase difference between this element and this element, with e to phi, and then another phase difference between these elements, four angles. And I did this distribution in a very specific way by following the structure of the Gelman matrices. So I treat this one and this one as a block, as if a two-level system with some phase difference between two. When I zoom in here, I have lambda 3, familiar sigma z matrix, and then another two-level structure. So if you express this thing, so this is a uh, this uh, coherence vector lives in uh, eight dimension on seven sphere, but now if you do this thing, it can be expressed as on two spheres, one exterior sphere where the poles are given by complete polarized on the last Gel the Gelman diagonal Gelman matrix, and then one interior sphere where the poles are S3 vector. Sigma lambda three uh, sandwich as it is maximum. So and this description is actually quite generic because when I go to an n-level system, generalized Gelman matrices, they must be traceless, right? So what are the possibilities? How many traceless vector matrices you can write? You can put one 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 minus n minus one traceless, and I'm going to treat this one and this block as a two sphere. When you zoom in here, another one 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 two minus n another like two level system all the way down to lambda 3 and then when i'm writing the, uh, the state vector on cpn minus 1 uh, what i do is that i take a two level description embed it in another two level description take it and embed it in another two level description as so and so these spheres are arranged like a matryoshka dolls and 
be also so rich. I mean, what are the possibilities of seeing matryoshka dolls in two consecutive talks? So, so these nested spheres are arranged like matryoshka dolls. And this is a complete generic description of an n-level quantum system, a QDIT. So if I am interested in topology now, for example, because if I have churn number and if I have a two-level system, I know that this is expressed as the solid angle on the block sphere. So churn number is of pi 2 of S2. But when you have an n-level system, what is that S2? You lose that intuitive notion of it. But then with this description, it actually just, if you write down the Berry curvature, you see that this is actually expressed as a solid angle on these nested spheres, how much of the solid angle you cover it with some algebra, completely generalized to n-level system. And then after following this math, it is actually tells you that when you have some n-level system, you can treat this one and everything else as a two-level system. When you zoom in here, that's another two-level system. And this tells you that for Chern number, for example, this exterior sphere, the largest one, dominates. So it gives you a completely much simpler picture in terms of how these band transitions, topological transitions occur. But also, if you're interested in tomography, for example, um, in, you don't need to f to do a tomography on a QDIT. You don't need to go and measure the, every single element of the density matrix because there's a lot of redundancy. By picturing the dynamics on this generalized, this geometric way, we could cook up the much simpler tomography schemes for QDIT, for example, that are much general. But as a maybe last example, beyond topology again. So we heard about QDITs uh, and it's important to induce more QDIS, coherent QDIS to s extend the capability of our quantum computers. But another direction to go in this quantum computation is to increase the in internal Hilbert space dimension, right? By instead of qubits, you can do QDITs. So to reach the same dimension, you, list, you need m much less number of elements. And this for example, decreases the circuit complexity drastically, and then this can increase coherence time. So there are a lot of advantages. And until recently, very recently, until this paper, for example, you for a four-level QDIT system, you can create it when you have a four-level basis, but it hasn't been shown that like you can actually create any four-level QDIT that you can reach every point in your Hilbert space. And then such geometric description, when you have a four-level system, as I told you, for an n-level system, this can be expressed on n minus one two spheres. So you have three two spheres. And then such expressing the four-level QDIT Hilbert space in terms of three sphere. So in this paper, they could actually show that like, oh, they can prepare the any QDIT. Uh, so these, this kind of geometric structures can be quite useful uh, to, to in, in several, several um, directions. So with that, let me flash uh, some of the, my, my results. So I hope I could convince you that these multi-level systems that, 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 that they have been uh, newly, newly arising. So they are interesting uh, So because we we have, we have non-abelian braiding in a single particle uh, picture because fraction quantum states are interesting, but they can also, they bring their, come with their own challenges. So here we have the non-abelian braiding in the momentum space, in the classifying space. But also beyond this non-abelian braiding, where the floquet is an is a effective way of move the band nodes, but also to reach new phases. But beyond that, when you have this, sigma z matrix as the poles of my block sphere. So this description actually generalizes to all Gelman matrices, and then this can be quite useful with several applications too. With that, thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Noor. And uh, questions? Yes, uh, Adad. Thank you, Noor. Can I forget Floquet for a second? If mm -hmm. I think about the three bands that you had and you did the whole mm -hmm. procedure, yep. can I just still think of it as a Berry curvature that would give me a chair number for the first gap and then a band that has the opposite chair number that then makes it trivial? Yes. Perfect question. No. <laughs> <laughs> because Hamiltonian is real, your eigenstates are real. So these bands are completely trivial. Chair number is zero. There is no Berry curvature. But there is a there can be a Chern number description if you're in an orientable phase. If you're in this phase, 
So this is how we could actually predict this linking number description, because this relies on a hop map, which means that you need the map from S3 to S2, and then, then you can, uh, S2 means that you have a SU2 uh, uh, spin. So if you are in this completely gapped phase, so this band has chore number zero, no very curvature, also this one, but you can write a complexified band as psi1 plus i psi2, and then you can express things in a certain very limited regime. If your system is, there are no direct strings, and then if it's orientable, so you can connect to it, but essentially it's completely, you know, it's, it, it, it has different, different origins. So you can use some tricks, but these are trivial for no very curvature. So can I think of a spinner chair number? So that's the weighted Berry curvatures that would then give it? Not really. No? <laughs> no. So here in, in this thing, so this earlier, so this non-abelian Berry curvature, so if you, if you don't have any direct strings, so it can be expressed as a, for this third eigenstate, because I'm treating this as a vector on SO3, so it can be written something like a Pontryagin formula that we are familiar with mm -hmm. from the, so this is the best you can do. Uh, but on the bands itself, there is no curvature. Okay, so m maybe let us yes. finish. Thank you very much, Thank because you. we will have a long yes, break and we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you.